In 2023, an unthinkable thing happened. Apple took MagSafe, one of their proprietary technologies that they formerly locked millions of people into a cozy walled garden with, and they donated it to the Wireless Power Consortium. This created a new open standard called Qi2 that pretty much any brand could use more or less for free, achieving cross-compatibility with Apple's massive and massively lucrative MagSafe ecosystem. Now, Qi1 was already the most popular wireless charging standard for phones of all brands, and with the new generation, most of the magnetic self-alignment, smart communications, and the higher 15 watt charging limit from MagSafe would become part of the standard too. There was a huge wave of publicity and loads of expectations for what many called the MagSafe for Android. And yet, almost two years later, only a single model from a relatively small manufacturer adopted it. This is a pretty cool model for sure, but the rest of the industry is curiously missing. Rumors of Samsung's S24 series or Google's Pixel 9 series having Qi2 all proved to be wrong, when when asked, a Google representative even bizarrely said that, quote, there were no tangible benefits to switching to Qi2 for the Pixel 9. I've long been fascinated by this mystery, like, why is Qi2 adoption so slow? Is Qi2 not good in some way? And why did Apple give away the Qi2 standard for free? Here's what I found. Insta360 sponsored a segment of this video. Well, the only phone models on the market right now that officially support Qi2 are the HMD Skyline and iPhone models after the 12 series, the situation with chargers and power banks is quite the opposite. Every major charger brand from Anchor to Nomad or EcoFlow to Ugreen has Qi2 models across the board. And to first see if maybe the technical implementation is what's holding Qi2 back, I decided to test a bunch of these chargers, and right away I found some things that were a little bit counterintuitive. Charging an iPhone 16 Pro Max, all chargers were remarkably consistent. On the wired ones, I could measure how much power the chargers took as an input, and each model I tested hit around 18 to 19 watts at peak. Qi2 is rated to output 15 watts, so assuming that there's some loss in the conversion from the input to the output, this means that all Qi2 compatible chargers that I tested could consistently hit this peak as expected with the iPhone. And the charge curve looks pretty typical as well, with maximum speeds at first, and then a pretty gradual slowdown later on. The phone got a little hot at 41 degrees Celsius, or about 106 Fahrenheit at peak, but that is perhaps not too alarming. Given that the magnetic alignment helps to keep the coils properly aligned for good efficiency, this all makes sense. And so here you might say, hey, Qi2 as a standard totally works, and indeed, if you have an iPhone, probably does, at least on the ones that I tested. But with the Skyline, things get a little bit less consistent. Not a single one of the chargers here managed to maintain the advertised power draw of at or over 15 watts for more than a few seconds. The Nomad stand came closest, which generally settled around drawing 11 to 13 watts. That is a third less than the iPhone at its peak, though looking at the charging curves, we can see that while the iPhone initially outperforms the Skyline pretty obviously, which by the way has almost the exact same size battery, the Skyline almost doesn't slow down at all until the very end, so the overall speed difference is fairly negligible. Also, because the Skyline doesn't have the full speed boost in the beginning, it stays a bit cooler, never going past 39 degrees. Beside the Nomad stand, the Ugreen Uno and the Anchor MegGo powerbank came pretty close, but were a little bit slower in my testing for a joint second place, while all the other chargers typically settled at around 9.6 watts of peak power draw. That is pretty much half of what those same chargers managed to peak at with the iPhone. So yeah, I'd say with the HMD, the speeds are a little bit all over the place, and depending on which exact model you get, you might actually get something that is noticeably slower than what you'd get on the iPhone, but I'd say the standard, overall, still kind of works. The magnetic mounting is much nicer than having to fiddle with alignment every time. The temperatures are fine, so efficiency should be okay. And getting a full charge in a bit over two hours is perhaps not groundbreaking, but not too bad either. Also, Qi2 has a significant cost benefit versus MagSafe. While MagSafe accessories have to be certified by Apple and companies have to buy the MagSafe module from Apple itself, Qi2 devices only need a WPC certification and the module can be made by anyone. This means that many companies reportedly save $9 per device on average during manufacturing which is significant. Now, of course, MagSafe has a few of its own benefits as well. First, the newest version of MagSafe introduced with the iPhone 16 series is now rated for 25 watts, which means it should be noticeably faster than the current Qi2 standard, and more on that shortly. Second, MagSafe also has this little magnetic line at the bottom that Qi2 doesn't, which leads to a slightly more sturdy feeling alignment. Fun fact, Qi2 can even exist completely without magnets, in which case you just get the 15 watts speed, but I haven't really seen that in any device myself yet. 
And third, MagSafe accessories can communicate more things with iPhones, so they can, for example, remember the last used standby clock, or they can display color-matched animations with Apple cases. So those should be considered, but I don't think any of them are big enough deal breakers to be the sole cause of the lack of adoption on Android. A random paper I found said that the MagSafe accessory market was at $9.5 billion last year, so I bet there would be plenty of people paying for a slightly more commoditized Qi2 as well. Anyway, moving on to the phones, the Skyline thankfully has a repairable design so we can easily pop its backplate off to take a peek at its module, which seems fairly straightforward. Here you can see a little charging coil inside the black sheet, which I guess is graphite for heat dissipation, and all of this is surrounded by some metal, which would house the magnets and also further dissipate the heat. HMD and New Current, a company that specializes in wireless charging tech, both told us that the implementation can be a little bit tricky on the phones as it requires working around magnetic and electrical interference with the device, plus HMD having a sort of removable back also means that they need some specialized connectors, but none of this seems like black magic. So technical challenges are not likely to be the main reasons for the lack of adoption either, and instead I've come up with the following conclusions myself. For Chinese brands, Qi2 might ironically be too slow. Many brands like Oppo and OnePlus already support something like 50 watt wireless charging with fans and whatnot, while Huawei even introduced 80 watts in the last few days. 80 watts! Qi2 must seem crazy slow in China. Also, proprietary fast charging standards have dominated the Chinese market for a decade now, so slow standards just might not seem very important to them. As for the magnets, we've talked to a few brands and most of them seem to be keen on putting them into optional cases for now. The thinking is basically to keep the thickness, the weight and the cost out of the devices themselves and to just offer it as an optional extra for those who want it. HMD told us that their implementation adds about 0.7 millimeters of thickness, which is not bad, but it's also clearly not insignificant. And meanwhile, outside of China, Samsung and Google would be the two obvious candidates for adoption, and I've heard the same rumor again and again about both from multiple people in the industry. Sure, Qi2 is an open standard, and everyone I've talked to praised the Wireless Power Consortium, which develops it as a pretty great standards body. On the surface, every participating member has one vote, and the WPC says that the brands are in a quote, collaborative competition. But Apple Apple is clearly the 900 pound gorilla in the room and their power over this technology clearly makes Samsung and Google a little bit uncomfortable. Apple joined the WPC in 2017 when they adopted the Qi wireless charging standard on the iPhone 8 series and also the iPhone 10. Before then, the market had various competing standards, but once Apple made its choice, Qi basically became the de facto standard almost overnight. The WPC says that it added almost 400 members within months, and the race was basically over. Ever since, Apple has also taken the WPC way more seriously than others. Not only did they basically donate a lot of the Qi to tech themselves, the WPC is also currently chaired by an Apple employee, Fadi Mishriki. He was the co-founder of wireless charging company Power by Proxy, which Apple acquired in 2017, and he remains an Apple employee until today, while also chairing the WPC. Meanwhile, many of our interviewees also pointed out that Apple just brings way more employees, way more suggestions, way more technologies to all of the meetings and everything else, all the work groups, and so they kind of get to set the agenda in a way. And the iPhone 16 series getting 25 watt MagSafe charging highlights a particularly clever way of them exerting control. Apple can basically build the next generation of the technology and keep that exclusive to their own phones for just long enough to make a difference, and then they eventually donate most of that to the WPC so the new stuff becomes the standard for everyone else long term. This way they can both stay like a generation ahead of most other companies while still influencing the standard. This setup also lowers the incentives for brands like Google and Samsung to develop their own proprietary versions when the Apple thing eventually likely becomes the good enough standard anyway. A bunch of industry insiders told us that they thought Apple donated their tech to the WPC because they wanted to avoid the EU eventually forcing them to adopt some generic standards like they did with USB-C, and the genius way that they set things up means that they can kind of hit two birds with one stone. They both get to claim that they are the main contributor to the standard, while they can also make sure that they are one step ahead of most other companies. Pretty brilliant. Now importantly, I'm not saying that this is unethical. Voting rights are fairly distributed across the brands. Of course, another brand could outdesign and outspend Apple and donate their proprietary tech to the WPC, but they're choosing not to. That said, the reality here is that Apple has such a head start and such market power over accessory ecosystems and such that for now, following their lead seems like the most realistic option, which Apple's biggest competitors, understandably, just aren't too enthusiastic about. HMD told us that they didn't have a problem with this as they are a small brand. While Samsung and Google feel the need to play defensively against Apple, HMD just needs to stand out in pretty much any way possible and so being the first device maker to adopt Qi2 was a great way for them to get people like you and I to talk about them. 
And to be fair, I eventually expect Samsung and Google to adopt Qi2 on their devices as well. While both the S24 and the Pixel 9 series were rumored to support Qi2 in some form, neither seems to get past 5 or 6 watts on the Qi2 charger for me, and neither is officially Qi2 certified, so I think these rumors were basically wrong. That said, both already support 15 watt wireless charging, or even faster just with their own proprietary solutions, and Samsung even has a Qi2 certified device. The Samsung Galaxy Ring is the only device listed on the website of the Wireless Power Consortium, beside iPhones and the HMD Skyline, that officially supports the standard. Of course, this is referring to the case, and sadly without the magnetic alignment, but this is a first step. Qi2 chargers also really only started becoming properly popular halfway through this year, and as you can see, they're still a little bit inconsistent, but as the ecosystem starts building, I think adding the magnets and such to the phones will start making more and more sense. An executive vice president at Granite River Labs, who is a very well-respected industry insider, told us that 2025 was poised to be the breakthrough year for Qi with magnetic power profiles and smartphones, meaning that next year really should be the year when all of this goes mainstream. Also, Qi 2.1 is just around the corner, and my guess is that this will be announced at CES 2025 in just a few months. 2.1 should increase speeds, which is supposed to narrow the gap with the iPhone 16 series, and that should help with further adoption. Okay, and to finish, you know I live in Berlin, right? If you know this city, you might wonder how on earth I got this shot in a place where drones are not allowed at all. Well, I went up to the one tall hotel around here, and the trick was to have a camera that can get through the protective net that you can't normally bypass. That was no match for my 3 meter long invisible carbon fiber selfie stick and the most creative camera that I know, the Insta360 X4, which you can now get with a Black Friday deal. This is a 360 degree camera that can get you shots that almost no other camera can. I gave it to my girlfriend to take on her holidays and she got some really great boat shots, again with the invisible selfie stick so it kinda looks like you're flying a drone. We took it with us when we went kayaking on this fantastic trip in the summer. I pack it with me every time I go on a nice bike ride or generally anytime I do something cool. The camera can shoot up to 8K, which is a ton of resolution that lets you crop in and reframe your shots after you shot them however you like. And all of this is super easy to do on the mobile app, both on Android and on iOS. You can, for example, either tell the app to automatically track subjects inside the video, or you can tilt and move your phone around to select the parts that you want to export. Really cool. With the Black Friday deal and my link below, you can now get 15% off the X4, and the first 10 buyers will also get an invisible selfie stick for the next few days. Oh, and this shot, this was taken on the Insta360 GO 3S, the perfect tiny camera for POV shots that I've also linked to down in the description. So check out the Black Friday deals in my links, and I'll see you in the next video.